So I want to welcome you one and all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us for this very, very special panel discussion here in June, which is World Oceans Month. And we're having our own panel to commemorate the ocean, to educate us all on the oceans and how important the oceans are to us. They're so incredibly important and I cannot, we cannot overstate the importance of the oceans to our survival, to humanity's survival, to the earth's survival, to living beings' survival. As we speak, there is a UN ocean conference occurring in Lisbon, of course, would love to be in Lisbon. Um, but, you know, th the theme there is save our ocean, protect our future. It's, and again, it couldn't be more prescient. Uh, I'm not going to go and speak too much, but as most of you know, every year the planet is warming. And while there are some ebbs and flows within that. Some years may not see the same degree of warming as others. Every single year, year upon year, the oceans are consistently warming in stepwise fashion. So if anything is to be done, it must be done now. And we're very, very lucky um, to be joined with four amazing people. Just quickly, I'll name them. Professor Berbel Honish from Lamont Daugherty Earth Observatory out of Columbia University. Emily Duan from the New England Aquarium. Professor Phil Traffen from the British Antarctic Survey. And Andrea Treese from Earth Justice. So it's just such an honor. And we are going to begin with Professor Berbel Honish who is a uh, paleoceanographer, I think I got this right. And whatever I said incorrectly, please, please do correct me. And I'm so excited to hear from you. You said that perfectly correctly. It's not the paleoceanographer like word I like to, to turn this into. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here real quick and show you a couple of slides. So um, I was, as a paleoceanographer, I was talked, uh, tasked to talk about um, the history of the oceans, which is really 4.3 billion years. I'm not going to talk about that. That's, there's not enough time. But I thought I would start out with a little review of, of where I actually came from. So when, when I started to figure out what I wanted to do for my professional life, I thought I wanted to study marine biology. And I had all these great ideas. I like the beach. I like coral reefs. I liked all kinds, kinds of fish. Um, there's, uh, here's, this is actually a place where I'm going next, uh, actually in two days, to Catalina Island in California, where there's kelp forest. So I loved all these, all these organisms. Um, but then when I started studying my marine biology, it actually uh, turned out very, very quickly that you don't have any of these wonderful creatures in the ocean unless you have something that they can eat. And what they can eat is mostly the plankton in the ocean. And so um, this is this is a kind of a, the artist's idea of how plankton looks like. Uh, of course, there are lots of plankton organisms in here. Later on, I will talk a little bit about these guys over here. This is a planktic foraminifer, and that is what I spend most of my of my research on. Um, but I just wanted to say this is these are all very important organisms. Um, of course, the more fish we have, the more food there is for people, and so the ocean is very important as a food source for us, but it's also an interconnected system with life on land and with the atmosphere. So the ocean determines what kind of climate we have, it, it determines how much rainfall we have, it determines whether we get storms, hurricanes, and, and so on. So understanding the ocean is really very, very important. Now, when, um, I, since I was tasked to talk, about, uh, to talk about the past, first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about what concerns my research, and that is mostly carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So you've probably all heard from, uh, from the news about this, this concept of global warming. Regina just mentioned it. The more carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere, the more of a greenhouse effect we have, the warmer it gets on the planet. But there is a second problem in, um, in that, that carbon dioxide causes, and that is carbon dioxide does not only stay in the atmosphere, but it actually also gets uh, absorbed by the ocean. And in the ocean, it reacts with the seawater, and it forms an acid that is called carbonic acid, and that leads to ocean acidification. And that is what some people have called the evil twin of global warming or the, the other CO2 problem. 
What it does in the ocean it, it, that it mostly affects marine organisms that secrete calcium carbonate houses. Um, here's one example. These are, these are experiments that have been done with planktic snails. Uh, they're called pteropods or sea butterflies. And this is a sequence of, of pictures of snails that have been, that have been grown under normal uh, seawater acidity that we, had, uh, that we have today, and then seawater acidity that we're expecting by the end of the century. And you can see that these snails are getting thinner and thinner and they get malformed. And so they're having a harder and harder time to secrete these shells that actually protect their bodies. Now, it turns out that most of you will probably not ever have seen any of these, uh, of these organisms. But, it, but these are actually very, very important food source, for instance, for Pacific salmon. And so if these organisms cannot live anymore as they used to live in the past, then that will have consequences for, for our food chain as well. And so from that perspective alone, it's important to understand what is going to happen. Of course, now we want to know how bad is it going to bet the, how bad is it going to get? We have, we have uh, experiments that we can do in the laboratory, but these experiments often take hours, days, sometimes weeks, sometimes years if we're lucky. But in most cases, they don't allow organisms to adapt to these conditions and see where, they're, where they might be heading in the, in the future. And that is a reason why we like to go and, and look into the, into the paleo environment. Um, before I go there, uh, there's one other picture that I wanted to show you. And this is, uh, this is one of the consequences of global warming. This is a picture of uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And you can see some of these, these white corals over here. These white corals have undergone bleaching because the ocean has gotten so warm in several warming episodes um, that, the, that the corals actually expel the algae that, uh, that are living with them. And they can do that for a short period of time, but, but the, the, the corals actually depend on the algae to provide them with a, with a food source. And so if this uh, condition lasts too long, the corals will actually die. And that is something that has happened over time for, for, quite, a, for quite, a, quite a while now. So in 2016, we had an El Nino that made it really warm on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, this, is a picture, this is a picture here of Australia, and that's, an, that's this little um, cutout here to show you which parts of the Great Barrier Reef were the most affected by this. And you can see that um, in, in some cases up to 26, even 83% of the, of the reefs uh, have died as a, as a function of the warming. They can recover, and, um, and so these are, these are natural events that can come over and over and over again. But unfortunately, these, these warming events have happened again and again and again. So we had one in 2016, the next one in 2017, the next one in 2020. And so um, you get the idea that there are more and more of them happening. And so this is one of the concerns that we have. And coral reefs are important nursery grounds for fish. Um, so global warming is the one problem. The other problem is the carbon dioxide. Now, since I'm a paleoceanographer, I like to look not so much at pretty pictures, but actually at a lot of wiggly lines. And this is a picture that, um, that, that you will, um, well, that, that makes my life. What you're seeing here is a timeline. So I promised I would talk a little bit about Earth history. I'm not going to talk about the entire Earth history, but I'm talking about the last 70 million years. So we're starting 70 million years over here that goes to the modern over there. And now we have several panels down here that show you different pieces of information. The top one over here is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that has been reconstructed from various different what we call proxies. I do not have the time to talk about that. But what you can see here is that carbon dioxide in the modern is relatively low. Today we're actually pre-industrial, we had about 280 parts per million. Today we have about 420. And now you can go back in time and you realize it was getting higher and higher and then there were times when it was, when it was lower. What makes this interesting for us is, is that the, the geological record and the, these natural events that have happened in the past, they allow us to get a sense to find out how warm it was at those times in the past. So how high was carbon dioxide in the past? When was the last time that carbon dioxide was as high as it is today or as we expect it to see in the future? And how was the climate like at that time? And so what we're doing right now by burning all this carbon dioxide one of the expectations is that by the end of the century, we might see carbon dioxide levels that are on the order of about 900 to 1,000 parts per million, which means we have to go back over here into the, um, into the, um, into the Eocene. And so the Eocene, when you think about what the climate was like, the temperature curve is shown down here. The, the, the scale for the temperature is on the right-hand side. 
Today, the modern average temperature is about 14.5 degrees Celsius. If you go back into the, into the Eocene, it was about 10 degrees warmer than today. So that gives us a sense of where our climate might be heading. Down here, we have another, um, another indicator for climate change, sea level rise. Uh, you may have heard that sea level has risen so far by about 20 centimeters due to global warming. If we're going back into the Eocene, sea level was higher by about up to 50 meters. So this is a really big change. I'm not saying that this is what we're going to see by the end of the century, but it's, it's, it's on the very long geological timescales, this is where our Earth is heading. And down here we have a couple of globes that show you the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere at different time intervals in Earth history, and they show you how we have more and more ice going forward. So this is, this is our current situation where we have ice on Greenland and ice in Antarctica. Um, at this time in the, in, the, um, in the Eocene, we did not have any ice on Antarctica. Or if anything, then maybe some snow, snow fields. We did not have any ice in Greenland. So um, this, is, this is what interests me. Um, of course, now we also want to see what, how do our organisms respond to this. And so um, to do that, we have to work on proxies. And I don't want to go into all these details. But basically how this works is that the carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. It dissolves in the surface ocean. When it dissolves in the surface ocean, it drops the pH or it makes the seawater more acidic. And that is reflected in the, the, the speciation and the isotopic composition of boron, which is dissolved in seawater. So the boron isotope proxy is my proxy that tells me about seawater acidity and then by extension about the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It turns out that this boron gets incorporated into these planktic foraminifera that I, that I mentioned earlier. They live in the surface ocean for about two to four weeks. And when they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean and they litter the sea, they, they literally litter the seafloor. They're everywhere in the, in, in the deep ocean. What we can do now is we can take sediment cores. A sediment core has the beauty that the younger things are on top and then the deeper you go, the older it gets. So we get a timeline of this. We can take discrete samples out of these sediment cores, analyze them in fancy instrumentation, get the boron isotopic composition, and then reconstruct what the seawater acidity was and then infer what the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was. And so we have done this for one event uh, that I want to point out over here real briefly, and that's this little little thing over here. So this little sore thumb um, is a very uh, prominent climate event. Uh, at first, when, when scientists found this, they thought this was a, this was, they were just erroneous data, but they have now been confirmed all over the planet. And it is an event when, um, when the globe warmed by about five to nine degrees Celsius, and it turns out that the seawater was acidified to the degree that the sediments uh, actually dissolved. So this is a series of sediment cores that come here from Walfish Ridge, which is off the coast of Namibia. You can see the, the, the color change here that goes from light colored to dark brown, and then slowly, slowly it comes back to, to light colored. This is an event that happened 56 million years ago. And this color change here is an indication that the calcium carbonate sediments that were deposited at the bottom of the ocean dissolved and gave way to, to clay deposition. And then slowly, slowly, that recovered again. Here's a bigger picture of one of those sediment cores uh, that's actually here from the, from the Pacific Ocean. You can see this color change, and you can see five, uh, sorry, three dec discrete pictures from these intervals before the event, just right after the event, and then a little bit after the event again. And these pictures here, these are again planktic foraminifera, and they, they will all look like popcorn to you. They're, they're tiny little, little organisms, they're all largely magnified. But the magnification for these three pictures is the same, and you can see that in this picture directly after the event happened, the organisms are much, much smaller. They're actually different in species composition from what we found before, and the species that occurred before did not show up at a, at a later time again, which means there was, there was dwarfism amongst, amongst the organisms, there was, um, there was uh, extinction among the organisms, there was evolution of new species. And what is really interesting here is if you, if, if you, you know, with all the reconstructions that we have done, we found out that the warming is actually relatively similar to what we're expecting by the end of this century, five to nine degrees Celsius. Acidification is also similar to what we're expecting by the end of this century. So the pH will drop by about 0.3 pH units if we do not reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. There were ecosystem changes, but what is different here is that instead of what we're doing today, where we're changing the system over the course of a couple of decades or maybe 100 years, the onset of the duration of that event took about three to 5,000 years. And that means that the pH change at that time was about 0.01 units per century, whereas today we're changing it by about 0.1 unit per century. So what was happening then happened 
about 10 times slower compared to what we're doing today. And that already puts into perspective of how in incredibly strong this, this change in, in, um, in, in environmental conditions that we're imposing today, how that is. The other part that is really important is for this recovery to go back from brown to white, that took about 150,000 years. And so that means that what we're doing today, if we do not change this, it will stay with us for something like 600 generations of people. So that kind of drives home the urgency of this, um, of this problem. I want to, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen here and I'm going to hand it over to the next, to the next panel member. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Honish, for that uh, incredible um, introduction into uh, paleoceanography. Um, the scale on which you're speaking is just uh, absolutely uh, mind boggling. Uh, I am going to now introduce Professor Trathan from the British Antarctic Survey. And I want to remind you, uh, for those of you who have questions for the panelists, please uh, just send them directly to me, Regina Valdez in the chat. We've already gotten a few and I appreciate it. So please uh, go ahead and send your questions to uh, just DM Regina Valdez in the chat box. And now we'll be hearing from uh, Professor Trathan. Hi, thank you, Regina. And um, as you can see from uh, my title, I actually retired um, from British Antarctic Survey. I retired uh, just at the end of May. So um, I'm a free person now, I'm no longer a government employee, and I can say what I like rather than being constrained as government employees often are. Um, but actually, the messaging that um, I always gave through my professional career is pretty much the same as I'll continue to give um, because as scientists we're driven by facts and evidence and uh, that's what's important to all scientists. So the area that I worked in um, uh, is uh, not quite as warm as uh, where Professor Hernish worked. Um, I was in the um, Southwest Atlantic, so we have South America just coming down here on, on the left with the Falkland Islands. And the areas that I've worked in particularly are at South Georgia, um, the South Orkneys and the Antarctic Peninsula. And these areas are all um, exhibiting elements of climate change um, in, in, in a lot of different um, areas, not just in the oceans, but terrestrial as well. Um, climate change in the Antarctic is not as rapid as it is in the Arctic. The Arctic sea ice is um, diminishing very rapidly compared to in the Antarctic. But I'll show you uh, just a few slides of what is going on at South Georgia, the South Orkneys in the peninsula, and then some of the challenges that that face, uh, presents with um, scientists and policymakers. So South Georgia, um, it's a mountainous island. It's a little bit like somebody chopped the top off the Rockies and dumped it into the ocean. Um, it's got glaciers, which are marine terminating. Each of these dots is um, a marine terminating glacier. And you can see that pretty well all of them, apart from the few black dots, are now retreating. This paper's from um, 2010. and um, now I think even the black dots are retreating. So we're seeing very major changes which affect the terrestrial system. Uh, this particular paper was um, worried about invasive rats joining up between glaciers, but actually the, the outflow from each of these uh, marine terminating glaciers um, brings silt and glacial flour into the ocean, and that changes the dynamics of the ocean. At the South Orkneys, um, there are a number of freshwater lakes, and these over the latter part of the uh, 20th century have warmed um, approximately one degree C in 40 years. The number of ice-free days has decreased um, markedly over that same interval, and this has impacts um, on nutrients. So um, air temperatures, water temperatures increase, and we get um, stronger growth of uh, phytoplankton, which are the small algae that grow in the lakes, so that over um, 
four to five decades, we see that there are actually more um, algae represented by chlorophyll A in the water. And then at the Antarctic Peninsula, um, something like 244 marine glaciers um, are recorded. The red dots show where they are retreating and the blue dots where they are um, actually uh, extending or stable. And the reason that the uh, northern Antarctic Peninsula has more blue dots and more stable glaciers is because um, very cold water coming out of the Weddell Sea uh, retroflects around the peninsula, and that's keeping these northern glaciers cooler, so the water underneath the glaciers um, is actually uh, stabilizing them and they don't break up as much as where we have warm water coming in the Antarctic circumpolar current. If we look at um, seasonal sea ice, so what I've talked about so far is uh, terrestrial water, frozen water on land, which um, slowly moves down the continent, down the islands to the ocean. This is actually frozen seawater, so different sort of ice. And the key issue that you can see is that it's very regional. So in the Antarctic Peninsula region, where I've been working mostly, then we are seeing um, later advances of sea ice and earlier retreats of sea ice. So that means that the duration of the um, winter is actually shorter. The duration of the ice tree period is longer. So uh, compared to other parts of the uh, Antarctic continent, you can see there's a mosaic of um, some re um, increasing sea ice periods and others where it's decreasing. So it's not a simple, straightforward picture. There are there's variability. And the models for the Antarctic are not as good as for the Arctic yet. So there's still a lot of uncertainty about what is happening to sea ice in, uh, in the Antarctic continent, in the Antarctic oceans. Um, a recent compendium by the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research, SCAR, and this is um, hot off the press. It was presented to the Antarctic Treaty meeting um, only last month. And um, looking at the physics around the Antarctic, then we're um, forecasting increases in temperatures, more heat waves, um, greater amounts of precipitation, stronger winds, and some of the um, indices of climate um, are going to become more positive. So those are atmospheric changes that are going to really impact upon the Antarctic. So in the oceans, we're seeing warming throughout the water column, including in the deep ocean. Um, we're seeing sea surface temperatures and their forecast to increase um, by approximately 1.75 degrees C by the end of this century. We're anticipating seeing changes in current patterns and then um, changes in pH. So um, we will have acidification. Um, there'll be freshening as we have more meltwater from land ice, so glaciers and ice shelves, um, and there'll be deoxygenation. Sea ice is currently variable um, and it's regional. Ice shelves are rapidly declining. So the West Antarctic ice shelf is losing mass considerably. The East Antarctic ice shelf is beginning to lose mass. So we may actually lose the West Antarctic ice shelf by um, 2300. So um, in 250 years, we'll be looking at a very different situation. And then frozen ground is uh, beginning to thaw. So some of the consequences for um, sorry, um, biology are that we will see um, reductions in uh, or changes in the geographic uh, domains of some seabirds and some seals. 
Antarctic krill, which is what I've spent most of my life working on. Um, we're expecting to see um, changes in the abundance and changes in the geographic scope. Some of the penguin species that uh, are predators of Antarctic krill, we expect to see some of those changing. We're already seeing changes in some species. And for emperor penguins, we project that there'll be uh, important changes over the course of this century. We'll see invasions of various um, uh, lower life forms, benthic life forms probably, but also terrestrial life forms. Some of the growth rates on uh, terrestrial plants are actually increasing. We're beginning to see species replacement and then invasions on land as well. So we anticipate over this century to see some important ecological changes. But one of the um, sort of icons of the Antarctic, I guess, um, is uh, the emperor penguin. And with current greenhouse gas emissions, then in a business as usual uh, scenario, then we anticipate that almost all emperor penguin colonies around the continent will be quasi extinct by um, the end of this century. If we're able to hold greenhouse gas emissions to two degrees C, then we will see that some of these colonies uh, based on sea ice projections uh, are gonna remain, but they're still going to be in decline. Only if we can hold to the Paris Agreement of 1.5 will emperor penguins have a reasonable chance of survival in the wild. And I think certainly most of my colleagues feel that um, sticking with 1.5 is now faint hope, um, but um, we can always hope that governments um, actually do act and um, are able to stay, stabilize greenhouse gas emissions. So um, with, uh, we're currently around here, uh, approaching uh, the 1.5 agreement goal. And um, with all policies and pledges in place, then we might have a chance at stabilizing below three degrees C. But that means that people have to change their lifestyles, government have to bring in restrictions, and um, we know how challenging that is going to be for some governments. So that all seems quite straightforward, but actually it's never as simple as one might hope. Um, the Antarctic has seen a lot of exploitation over the uh, past two centuries. There's been enormous um, harvesting in the past of seals, of baleen whales and finfish stocks. Some of these stocks and species are now beginning to recover and they will have big implications for food webs. So that means that it, it's going to be very difficult to disentangle climate change from ecological change for other reasons. So, for example, um, a recent paper from my group, we looked at the uh, consumption of Antarctic krill by baleen whales, fin whales and humpback whales, and compared it with 11 species of flying seabird and three species of uh, Antarctic penguin. Historically, Antarctic penguins have been one of the big consumers, but now baleen whales consume more than all those other species combined. So they are recovering and that will have big implications. The modern fishery for Antarctic krill will also have big in, um, impacts if not carefully managed. And this is going to be challenging because the members of the Antarctic Treaty monitor in different places around the Antarctic Peninsula, South Georgia and the South Orkneys, so we can look at ecosystem change. But there are only 14 sites spanning a distance of about 2,000 miles. That's like going from where you are in New York to Yellowstone. So if you try to predict the weather um, with just 11 weather stations between New and Yellowstone, you can see how challenging that might be. So this is Antarctic krill. This is what I've spent most of my life working on. Um, in the Antarctic Treaty, we are trying to protect species that uh, feed on krill, so emperor penguins. 
and through the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, um, we've been developing marine protected areas and uh, precautionary management approaches for the krill fishery. And in fact, uh, those latter two are what I've spent um, the last 20 years doing. So uh, there are big challenges. The Antarctic, because it doesn't have a indigenous population, some of those challenges are easier, but um, these challenges are gonna occur across the, the world ocean. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Trethen. Um, lots of serious implications there. Um, and uh, in terms of keeping 1.5 alive, yes, um, I hear that we will probably cross that, uh, you know, within the next few years here. Um, and I want to remind everyone, if for those of you who have questions, please do put them in the chat, send them to me. Um, and thank you for those of you who have already sent me questions. Um, and we will move on with our discussion uh, with Emily Duan from the New England Aquarium. One second, let me just reshare my screen. Mm -hmm. While Emily does that, um, I think one of the things, you know, in addition to life being lost, Professor Trathen, uh, if I'm correct, uh, with the melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet, there'll be serious uh, implications for the East Coast of the United States, specifically New York. Am I correct in this? Yeah, one, one of the um, key concerns about uh, loss of the ice uh, shelves, uh, the ice sheets, is uh, global sea level rise. Um, and so all low lying areas on the Earth's surface are gonna be subject to um, that uh, sea level rise. One second, just having a little issues with the screen. Uh, one of the things, that, one of the, uh, um, you know, begin whenever you're ready, Emily. One of the things I, I wanted to share is one of my the quotes that I absolutely love from uh, Sylvia Earle is that we need to see the beings in the ocean as sea life rather than sea food. And I thought that was quite profound. Awesome. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So hi, everyone. My name is Emily Dewan, and I'm the program officer for the Marine Conservation Action Fund. So really excited to be speaking with you all tonight and thank you for Regina to, for inviting me. So our previous speakers really set up how the climate change is impacting our oceans. So hopefully tonight I can give a few rays of hope um, for how is our oceans are being impacted and share some successful conservation stories um, from our program. So the Marine Conservation Action Fund is part of the New England Aquarium and, found, and housed within our Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life. So it's a micro granting and fellowship program. And we're really focused on um, supporting conservation leaders from around the globe. And so you can see here on the map, here is a map of all the different projects that we have funded. We were first started in 1999. And so since then we have found, um, supported over 150 projects in 50 different countries. Um, and so these micro grants can really help the aquarium kind of expand our reach across the globe. And so we have supported these conservation leaders in um, studying imperiled marine species and looking to how they can help support ocean life um, in their own communities. And so I'll just give a few quick examples of some of the projects that we have been honored to fund. So the first is the Bird's Head Leatherback Program in Indonesia. And so they study the leatherback turtle, which you can see here, which is pretty remarkable, the size of it compared to the person sitting on the canoe. Um, so we provided emergency funding for this group um, early on in their program to help continue their monitoring program of the species. Another example is after a bleaching event, which was mentioned earlier, that's affecting a lot of coral reefs. We're able to provide 
funds for scientists to um, examine the state of the reef after that bleaching event and track the recovery of some of those bleached corals. And then a final example is um, providing funds to help establish the first marine mammal stranding network in Iran. In Iran. And so um, through all these different projects, we've really learned the importance of funding local conservation leaders that are on the ground doing this work. A huge barrier to marine conservation is this notion of colonial science. Um, and so one of our MCAF fellows, Dr. Asha DeVos, who's a really incredible speaker, I, I highly recommend you watch her TED Talk if you haven't already, um, but she speaks a lot to this matter. And so in her op-ed, she wrote, colonial science is the conservation model where researchers from the developed world come to countries like mine, do research and leave without any investment in human capacity or infrastructure. It creates a dependency on external expertise and cripples local conservation efforts. The work is driven by the outsider's assumptions, motives, and personal needs, leading to an unfavorable power imbalance between those from the outside and those from the ground. So another word um, for this is parachute science. So um, people from higher income countries usually are parachuting into these areas and conducting science that really has no involvement or collaboration with the locals, um, which does not lead to successful conservation um, efforts. And so instead, Asha says that, I believe if they, we want to save our oceans, every coastline needs a local hero. Someone who speaks the language, can see the problems, and can help to address the solutions. Someone who is invested in the long term. So this has really guided the evolution of our program. Um, and so now we only fund PIs that are nationals from the country where the work is taking place. Um, so after these people leave, we want to make sure after the project is um, finished, we want to make sure these people aren't leaving and that they are continuing the conservation efforts for them to be successful. Also a requirement for our program is that the PIs must be from a low and middle income country. Um, so those are shown in green on the map here. And these areas um, house the, lot, the, lot, the most um, of the world's coastlines and also have key marine biodiversity hotspots. And a lot of the people in this country really depend on the ocean for food security and livelihoods, whether it's local fishers or other things. And they're really impacted by conservation threats many which are driven by higher income countries. For example, um, fisheries coming into these waters and depleting the local stocks that can have a really big impact on the local fishers there. And funding for these conservation projects is not equitable across the globe. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're funding this area um, where the conservation is really needed in order to be successful. And so right now we're working on a paper um, where we're looking at the impact of the program over the first 20 years. Um, so you can see in this time period, a lot of the projects that were funded were focused on data collection. And so using that to inform policy management decisions, um, next capacity development, then direct protection, whether on a species or an area, um, and then spatial management refers to the establishment of an MPA or something along those lines. And so I wanna share just a few stories from our MCAF fellows um, that really use a multifaceted approach to conservation. So not just doing the science and working with scientists, but working with all aspects of the community in order for their goals to be achieved. And so the first is um, Andres Lopez and his partner, Elena Zanella, who co-founded Mission Tiburon in Costa Rica, which focuses on hammerhead shark um, conservation. And so they not only did the, the tracking of where these hammerhead sharks were going, um, but they're also working with local community members. So here you can see a picture of them doing some education and outreach in a local school with some great hammerhead shark hats um, and their hard work paid off in 2018 when the president announced the first shark sanctuary in Golfo Dulce where they were conducting their work. So they really knew that they needed to engage a device group of people and that conservation also didn't ha doesn't happen overnight. So they were working um, for years in order for this shark sanctuary to be established. Another example is from one of our fellows, Kristen Forsberg, who works in Peru with manta rays. And so she um, founded Planeta Oceano, and this group works a lot with local fishers. And so here you can see her talking with some of those 
And making, when making these management decisions, you really need to involve these people, invite them to the, to the table because it will have a huge impact on their livelihoods. Also working with um, local communities. So she was also working with some school groups in Peru. And in 2016, Peru moved to protect the giant manta ray. So this is another example of kind of that multifaceted working with all different aspects um, in order to make conservation happen. And this has really um, tracked the involvement of our program too. So in 2015, we founded the fellowship program. So in addition to the microgranting that I mentioned earlier, um, we now have 12 conservation leaders that are from around the globe. And once they are in the fellowship program, they're with us for the duration of their career. So really focused on that relationship building, um, their sustainability of their organizations, whether it's providing funding um, for their organization or for impacting the next generation of ocean scientists too. A huge part of our fellowship program is bringing some of these conservation leaders to the aquarium. Um, we can use the aquarium's platform to help elevate the work that they're doing, but also create an exchange of ideas. So here is Thomas Diagni, who is the founder of African Chelonial Institute in Senegal. And so he came to our rescue and rehab facility in Quincy. And here you can see him working with a vet tech um, for some of our sea turtle rehab rehab and he's interested in setting up his own turtle hospital back in Senegal so that kind of exchange of information. We can also use the aquarium um, education programs to help uplift their work and so when Andres Lopez came from Costa Rica he was able to work with a local high school group um, so here you can see some of the students doing some surgery on some sharks some plus sharks here inputting those tags that he was using to track where the sharks were moving they set up a tub of water and we're also tracking the little plush sharks, how they're moving around and see how that can be used to be informing policy and management decisions. In 2019, we were really excited to bring all of our fellows together for the first time in person um, for an exchange of ideas at our first fellows summit. And so it was really sharing um, stories of hope from across the globe. And we're really excited to be starting to plan for our next summit um, that will be here in Boston in 2023. The last couple of years, we really um, focused on the importance of early career scientists and how they can impact our oceans. Um, so training that next generation. And so 2021, we launched the Early Career Ocean Professionals Program or ECOPS. Um, a huge problem in this sphere, field is that there's a lot of mentorship that goes unrecognized and unpaid for a lot of these conservation leaders. So in addition to funding these projects, we're really happy to provide funding for the mentors that were taking these um, early careers on under their wing. And so here are some examples from the first um, cohort that we had. And so Hafsa Jamel, who worked in Sri Lanka with Ocean Swell, was using GIS to map female dominated spaces and fisheries. Um, Jonathan Tremino, who worked with Crocodile Research Coalition, um, and he was looking at the impact of contamination and more let's crocodiles in northern Belize. Um, Trian Weathering, who also worked with Ocean Swell, was looking at biodiversity assessment of shipwrecks using baited remote underwater videos. And we were really excited to have one of our projects endorsed by the UN Ocean Decade. So I know Regina mentioned in the beginning that there is a conference that's happening right now. My colleague Elizabeth is actually there presenting on our project. Um, but our project is called the Ripple Effect Capacity Development for the Ocean. So it's in collaboration with 10 other um, fellows and grantees that we have in the program and kind of focused on scaling up the support of local leaders and their efforts to develop conservation capacity and stakeholders such as fishers, community members, and new emerging leaders in ocean conservation. So kind of to wrap up um, some lessons that we have learned that we believe have really shaped the evolution of our program, but which are needed to help tackle the immense um, challenges that our oceans are facing right now. Um, so small grants can be a very effective tool um, for conservation and social equity. Um, so these small grants that have rapid turnaround funding and more flexibility um, can allow a lot of these conservation groups in the areas to be successful in their projects. Um, also, in order for conservation to be successful, we needed a multifaceted approach. Um, we can't just be working with scientists. We need to be working with policy, politicians, um, local leaders, schools, and local fishers. And um, 
thinking of creative ways that we can bring everyone to the table to make sure that the conservation is reflective of what the community wants. Um, and we also need to be investing in the next generation of ocean leaders and local leaders. And really the, our program has kind of been shaped by listening, learning and adapting to all the fellows and grantees that we have um, in better suiting our program to help fit their needs. And so kind of what gives me hope for the ocean is hearing the stories of um, the work that they're doing and how innovative they can be and making sure that they're involving local communities and bringing everyone to the table. Um, so in order to tackle climate change and the threats of our ocean, we really do need to come together with everyone across the globe. We can't just focus um, on this alone. And so thank you so much. I've included the website for MCAF. You're welcome to take a look at the map um, and see all the different projects that we have funded and some of our social handles too. So thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. I have to tell you that was just, just hearing about the work that, you, that you're doing and supporting um, was just so hopeful and inspiring. Um, really have to, to give it up to you for uh, your organization for the very important work that, that you're doing in terms of, of conservation and involving the communities. Um, so thank you. And we will now hear from Andrea, Andrea Trees, um, attorney for Earth Justice. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to be here um, and just uh, amazed and excited to hear about uh, the incredible work that, that you all have been doing. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna be going over a pretty broad and quick overview of Earth Justice's work to promote biodiversity and climate resilience. Um, so please um, don't hesitate to ask questions afterwards or um, reach out after the presentation if you're if you're interested in learning more. Um, and I have spared you from the lawyer's attempt at PowerPoints. Um, so <laughs> apologies and you're welcome. Um, so those of you, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Earth Justice, we are a nonprofit law organization. We work with other nonprofits as well as community groups and individuals. Um, to promote both um, preservation and conservation of wildlife and fisheries, as well as, as human health, um, and, and of course the, the integration of the two. Um, and we do that uh, free of charge to our clients. So we, we try to really um, help folks all the way from providing them legal strategy for their campaigns um, through to litigation, um, it, which often involves trying to force the federal government to uh, live up to the requirements of federal laws like the Endangered Species Act. Um, I'm in our oceans program, which has two uh, major focus areas. One is um, fighting the development of offshore oil and gas drilling. Um, and the other one is uh, marine biodiversity and uh, wildlife and fisheries conservation that I mentioned. Um, and we do that work both um, domestically in the US, uh, largely through federal law, um, as well as um, more and more, we are partnering with our international program to do that on an international scale. Um, so the, the focus of my work has largely been uh, to try and move conservation and management of marine species from this very sort of single species focus, particularly with respect to fisheries, as Regina mentioned, this sort of commodification um, of species that focuses on how much we can extract, sort of how far towards the brink of extinction we can push species before um, they're gone, trying to shift that to the reality that all of these species are actors within the ecosystem. They fulfill roles. Um, taking these species out of the ecosystem um, necessarily has, has effects on everything else. Um, and so we're trying to inject that reality into conservation and management, which really involves a lot of trying to knit together science and law, uh, which is fascinating and quite challenging, um, especially in our current uh, judicial atmosphere. Uh, one of the ways that we have been doing this is through um, trying to protect what we call forage species. These are the little oily fish at the base of the food chain um, like uh, on the East Coast, you're probably familiar with herring and menhaden. Um, on the West Coast, where I do a lot of my work, sardine and anchovy are, are sort of the building blocks of that, the ecosystem 
um, fed on by everything from tuna to salmon to seals and sea lions, humpback whales, a lot of seabirds, you name it. Um, they're kind of the, the power bars of the sea. Um, and our work there has really focused on using the law to try to um, ensure that management measures are one, reflect what the, the science, you know, the, the best available science of what's going on in the water now. Um, things as basic, but surprisingly challenge as ensuring that the current science on how many fish are in the water in a given year becomes the basis for how many fish are allowed to be caught in a fishery in a given year. Um, that sounds real basic, but we've been fighting over that for nearly a decade and we're still in it. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's an ongoing challenge, but we have some really great partners in that work. Um, and also uh, we have been really pushing for an express evaluation of how many fish we need to leave in, in the ecosystem, particularly when these populations fluctuate and they sometimes drop. Um, how many we, we need to leave in the ocean to feed the ecosystem and ensure, again, not just survival of species, but that we have a vibrant, really resilient ecosystem that can withstand some of the, the, the inevitable ocean condition changes and stressors that are getting, getting thrown at us. We've also been developing work at the, the other end of the food chain um, to protect sharks uh, because sharks, like wolves on land, are often top predators in their ecosystem but they need to be numerous enough um, in order to really fulfill that, that role. And uh, most shark species around the globe have been diminished uh, dramatically by uh, both direct intentional fishing, um, you know, for shark fin soup, as well as for, as for meat and, and teeth, um, as well as, as accidental catch, what we call bycatch in fisheries that, that target other species like swordfish and tuna. And in particular, we've been um, using both the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Act and the Endangered Species Act uh, to, to try to push for protective efforts on the oceanic white tip shark and um, particularly in the Pacific. Um, we have that legal handle because it is listed under the Endangered Species Act. And we've been using those legal handles to try to push for um, changes in fishing gear, um, trying to transition towards more sustainable fishing methods, particularly um, given the number of sharks that get caught and killed in longline fisheries that target swordfish and tuna. And um, our hope there is both that we can help um, ecosystem balance and resilience by protecting sharks. And also that the, because these sharks are caught in fisheries that also catch a lot of other species, they, also, they catch critically endangered sea turtles, a number of seabird species, you know, a ton of other non-target fish species um, and other sharks. If we can sort of uh, get those fisheries to become more sustainable um, and push them towards that sustainability, it's kind of an umbrella for protecting other species as well that get caught incidentally on, the, on those fisheries. And we can also use that to um, promote those measures in other countries and in international fora and um, use that to also help advocate for capacity building for um, that the US use some, some funds for capacity building in countries what that might uh, benefit from those measures, but might not have the, the funding for them right now and just need, you know, need help um, funding and, and some support from the US government. Um, and finally, I wanted to touch on our work on otters because I know Regina uh, <laughs> was, was hoping to hear about that. And it is um, kind of a much needed uh, a bright spot, I think. Um, we got involved in um, some, a series of cases to protect the California sea otter, in part because they are actually, in addition to being undeniably charismatic, they are incredibly important to the ecosystem. They are a, uh, a keystone species. Um, because they are such voracious predators, they love to eat shellfish. They particularly love to eat sea urchins. Sea urchins like to eat kelp, um, and when they're the urchin populations are unchecked. They can they can uh, overgraze the kelp and and cause urchin barrens. 
Um, more recent research has actually also showed that sea otters benefit seagrass beds um, by uh, eating crabs that would otherwise eat little sea slugs that clear the algae off of, kelp, of the, the seagrass blades and allow them to photosynthesize. So it's just an amazing sort of trophic cascade um, that these critters are a part of um, that both helps to build up habitat um, and actually um, habitat that is a carbon sink in the case of both kelp and seagrass. So in my eyes, otters are kind of little, little climate warriors if we just um, deploy them well and support their populations. Um, so the way we um, engaged in that was to defend the Fish and Wildlife Service to end what was called the No Otter Zone program in, in 2012. Now, you might ask, what the heck is a No Otter Zone? There's a lot of history there. Um, basically, in the 1980s, the US Fish and Wildlife Service became very concerned that the otter pot, there was just one remaining otter population in um, California and central California. It was relatively small, um, still is relatively small. And they were concerned that it could be wiped out by an oil spill or just one catastrophic, catastrophic event. So they wanted to set up an experimental population uh, in the Channel Islands off in Southern California on San Nicolas Island. Um, that caused a lot of consternation with the fishing industry because, as I mentioned, otters eat a whole lot and they love shellfish. Um, so that led to a series of machinations and negotiations. What resulted was a, a standalone law that Congress passed um, that allowed the, the Fish and Wildlife Service to set up this experimental population, but they also had to set up this management zone or mo more colloquially, the no otter zone around the experimental population um, in which they were supposed to use all feasible non-lethal methods to remove any otters that strayed from the experimental population into this zone and you know, take them out and either return them to the parent population in central California or to the experimental population on San Nick. Um, that program did not work as intended. A bunch of otters disappeared because they tried to swim back. Um, they're not good at reading federal register notices. They don't look at maps and they don't believe in no otter zones. So um, this quickly sort of proved not very feasible. And by 2012, um, the agency took it off the books, took that program off the books. They hadn't enforced it for a bit. Um, but the fishing industry, led by a very um, conservative uh, legal organization called the Pacific Legal Foundation um, that advances a lot of very um, sort of conservative uh, doctrines um, and, and, and tries to sort of restrict agency authority to regulate, basically, um, sued the agency about and, and wanted to have that program reinstated. Um, we intervened on behalf of the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and through two rounds of district court litigation, um, appeals at the Ninth Circuit um, won and, and supported the, uh, the agency's ability to, to uh, end that program and simply let this, both the, the parent population of otters and the experimental population kind of expand um, without being interfered with, without being you know removed from the no otter zone, and um, without ha uh, being vulnerable to sort of unregulated unre um, take by fishing and other and and other causes. Um, so uh, hopefully um, that experimental population has actually increased in recent years. They're up to about a hundred, um, and the natural population has expanded southward. So. Hopefully these guys can continue to, to go where they need to go to, um, you know, eat and mate and make more otters and uh, hopefully help us uh, create um, more healthy kelp and seagrass habitat and, and help us with our, our carbon storage and our climate resilience. So um, I think on that note, I, I thank you very much and go otters. <laughs> Yay, thank you so much. Yes, yes, indeed. Go Otters. Uh, fabulous. And um, I really, really like how you just um, explained the interdependence of the ocean and all the beings in the ocean. I mean, nothing is an excess. You know, every, every it's a web. 
it's a web and there's simply no denying it. Um, and it's something that is incredibly important. And um, I am going to move on to questions with the time that we have. Um, and uh, reminder, for those of you who have questions, put them in the chat just for Regina. Um, and my first question is for Professor Honish, if I'm saying that correctly, I, I know it's not perfect. Um, and by the way, while these questions may be directed to one or another person on the panel, if you wanna to add to it, please feel free. But for, for Pe Professor Honish, the question is, how come different areas of coral reefs are more uh, or impacted more than others? I think, uh, well, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, but it really depends on where the coral reef is and which, which kind of latitudes it's, it stretches. So, you know, at some points it gets cooler and then the, the cooler areas are not going to be impacted as much as the, as the warmer areas. So that's probably mostly what that is, uh, what that is related to. So they're, they're, dif they're, they're literally, they're different, different reefs around the planet. Uh, they're in different um, climate zones. And so if they're in the warmer zones already, they're going to be more affected if there is a heat wave going over those, whereas others might actually benefit from it. They might have a good time because it's a little, a little warmer and that, uh, that helps them grow. But it really depends on, on where the corals are and, uh, and what the specific environmental conditions are in that area. Thank you so much. Um, uh, okay, and regarding, do you believe enough solutions? Okay, so there was a question, um, I believe this was uh, to Professor Traffin. Do you believe, because you had brought up the idea of solutions that we need, and the question was, do you believe that enough solutions currently exist to combat this problem? The problem being, of course, warming and, and staying to 1.5, which more than likely will not happen. Um, in a quick answer, no, there aren't enough solutions. Um, the problem is enormous. So if, if you look at uh, continental Africa at the moment, there are lots of areas which are very arid and um, it tends to be the younger male part of the population is migrating. So they are, they, they are um, billed as economic refugees, but they're actually climate refugees in many situations. And um, Southern Europe is now receiving large numbers of uh, climate refugees. Um, many countries are turning them apart, turning them away. So there is major structural changes needed across everything that we do, um, because there are, um, I think, major problems on the horizon that are addressed by different phrases, depending on where you're coming from whether you're an advocate for um, refugees or um, for not letting them in. And I suspect the southern states may well also be receiving um, large numbers of people who are not necessarily economic migrants, but um, there are parts of Mexico um, that are suffering drought. So there are very complex um, socio-political geographic issues across the planet, and we don't have solutions. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, definitely the Southern states and, you know, the, there's been droughts in the Northern Triangle for so very long. And of course we're getting refugees from there and uh, very sad to hear about uh, what happened in San Antonio today with the people who were found in the back of that trailer. Um, Many, many species are on the move due to global warming, uh, the human species as well, homo sapiens. Um, there was a question to um, uh, Andrea. Uh, so actually this comes from someone uh, here, uh, Paul, who's a, a partner in a commercial oyster farm on Long Island that produces about a million oysters and a little kelp. And the question is, is there something uh, that we should be conscious of in terms of oyster farming? Yeah, I think the, um, 
what I've seen, the, the main concern I've seen with oyster farming um, is mostly just ensuring that it's um, not, that, that seagrass habitat isn't removed um, to, to put in the, the equipment. Um, and that's something that we were actually involved with um, at Earth Justice and uh, looking at a project um, up in Humboldt Bay and, and sort of making sure it got kind of downsized and moved out of seagrass habitat that was vital habitat for other species and, you know, vital for carbon. Um, but, uh, you know, and sort of appropriately sized for where it was, but, but of course it can also be, um, you know, as you know, good for wa water quality. So I think it's just really balancing where it is and, and what the trade-offs are there. Thank you. Um... I believe this was to Professor Trathan. Uh, what complications will occur if frozen ground and the melting of ice sheets progress? And what are some examples of complications? So if we have um, frozen ground that thaws, then that can release trapped gases that are in the, uh, in the soil. So for example, you might have deposits of methane um, and methane is an active greenhouse gas that is actually more powerful than carbon dioxide. So um, if you release that, then you're um, speeding up uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, some of the, um, there are positives about some of these things for some species. So with more ice-free ground, some species of penguin are actually moving further south. Their populations are um, expanding. So there are climate change winners as well as climate change losers. Um, but if you're disrupting ecosystems with more losers than winners, then um, the net effect is going to be uh, loss of biodiversity. And some of those issues are going to be quite complex into the future, modelling some of those. I, I think um, loss of ice-free ground um, in the Antarctic is mostly going to be high in the mountains. So there's, uh, there'll be a certain amount in um, coastal areas, but that's not going to be available to a lot of species. So we might see more ice-free ground, but it's probably going to be only colonized by lichens, or maybe you pronounce it lichens in the US. Um, so um, yeah, some changes are going to be uh, tricky to predict the outcomes from. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question. This one is toward, uh, for Emily and Andrea um, regarding uh, fishing subsidies. Um, uh, uh, you know, fishing subsidies reach into the billions, I don't know, maybe it's hundreds of billions every year for massive fishing multinational companies to dredge and pull um, you know, sea life out of the oceans for sale and consumption, but also uh, for consumption, it, it seems for like animals, not just human animals. Um, and is there anything from the, um, anything that either of you are doing about that or, or have any, yeah, actions in regards to that, the fishing subsidies? Sure, yeah, so that is definitely a huge problem, um, especially for some of those countries that I was talking about when a lot of those large fleets are coming in and taking all the fish and not leaving enough for the local fishers. Um, so our, our group isn't doing too much to, to stop that, but to rather um, fund those local fishers that are doing great work and working with community members in that respect. Um, and so like making sure that we're, we're connecting those fishermen with the local policymakers that can move up the chain to make those regulations that could help stop some of those um, larger fleets from coming in and disrupting the ecosystem in that way. Thank you. Andre, do you have any thoughts on the subsidies? Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's it's a huge problem and and it's a huge problem in in sub in keeping together, keeping going fisheries that really are out of scale with um, what anything that's sustainable. Um, and you know, thus far, we, we haven't done work directly on subsidies. We have done some work in trying to promote um, 
first get the US to adopt as strict regulations as in, in sustainable regulations as we can get at home and then get, you know, get them to push those in international fora for other industrialized countries. Um, and uh, we also have staff working on um, a, a related issue of uh, illegal, unregulated, and I always forget which which the on the other U in IUU fishing is, but um, IUU fish. There's an IUU fishing bill going through that we've been helping with, um, and labor issues associated with that because there's actually a lot of like really bad labor abuses in these these. Um, these fisheries as well. It's a huge, yeah, huge issue. Thank you. And Professor Trathan? Yeah, so in the Antarctic, there's a you know, large industrial fishery for Antarctic krill, which is mainly prosecuted by China, um, Korea, South Korea, Norway, um, a little bit by Ukraine, but I'm not certain whether that is still going ahead, and Chile. And the the vessels that are now being developed by Norway and China are able to take about 1,200 tonnes a day. So they basically put, so like forage fish, uh, sardines and um, anchovies, krill are the, um, the ecological link in the Antarctic. So baleen whales, um, seals, penguins, flying seabirds, fish, everything eats it. Um, and these vessels are able to um, set the nets and then they pump the cod end directly into the factory. So the nets will stay in the water for as long as there are krill around. And as I say, they can take 1200 tonnes a day. And it's just like mowing the lawn. God, they that's... potentially have massive impacts. So currently there are very strong regulations, but China, as you can imagine, is really pushing to change um, the operation of the fishery. Industrial, uh, yeah, that's frightening. Um, industrial fishing is, is just an absolutely frightening, frightening thing that we're faced with. Um, so uh, we have one last question. This one is for Professor, Professor Honish. Um, it's regarding ocean acidification, which you brought up. Um, this person says it's very scary, but it doesn't seem to get much attention. Um, so the question was, why is ocean acidification so important and how can we raise awareness more effectively? That's an interesting question. I, I would actually say amongst the scientists, it has, it has a lot of attention. Um, I'm not muted, right? And, um, and in particular, it raised a lot of attention when, when the oyster fishery was, uh, was affected by this. So it turned out that the, you know, the baby oysters, they need to make, once they're hatching from their egg, they, they need to make a shell within the first two days. And it turned out that in many cases, the, the seawater was too acidic for them to, to do that. And so uh, that actually ended up a lot in the, in the news. And there were many documentaries made about that. There were many uh, newspaper articles about it. So it is something that, um, at least in the scientific community, is, is very, very widely um, um, distributed. Uh, there's a lot of research going on, and um, and so it's it for all of these for all of these aspects. I, I'm I'm am I'm a teacher. I'm an instructor uh, at Columbia University, so I, I teach a lot of students, and I I really just hope when the the more I teach about that, that the more students will actually read these articles when they do come across them when they're reading newspapers and they might be interested in, in reading documentaries. So uh, spreading this information at universities, at school, um, in any kind of public events, I think what you're doing is, is, is fantastic. Uh, we're having our annual open house. We often have three, four, five thousand people who come to visit. And, and so those are really fantastic opportunities for, for people to gather information and to become more interested. And, and um, we just have to advertise those. Thank you so much. And I want to put a plug in for the Lamont Doherty Open House. I've been for the last several years and it's just such a fun way to spend the day. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, okay, um, here's a quick question. What are the thoughts on ocean fertilization as a solution to plankton loss? I've heard a lot about this. It's, it, it, it's, it makes me a little nervous, um, you know, throwing iron into the ocean to, uh, to bring about uh, plankton uh, blooms. Does anyone have any thoughts on this on the panel? 
have to admit it makes me nervous as well, um, just because you never know who you're going to um, who you're going to encourage to grow, and in particular a lot of one of the places where you have to do this, or that is the most lucrative one to do this, is the Southern Ocean, where we have uh, where we have a sanctuary where there are a lot of whales, and and so you don't know if you're encouraging something that might be toxic, if it's if it's you know you're changing the ecosystem entirely, all of a sudden you're encouraging species that might live further outside of the of the Southern Ocean that that come in and then and then um, push others out of the way. So uh, there's a lot of there are many complications about this, and so that I think the scientific community is very split about this. On the one hand, it's it's really exciting. It has happened in the past. We have seen that it takes up uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well. So that's an that's an exciting opportunity for even sequestering the carbon dioxide and minimizing the global warming and the acidification. Um, but it is it is a problem that is difficult to foresee what's going to happen. And in many many situations on our planet, whenever we thought we would introduce a new species to to cure a problem that we have introduced before, it has actually backfired. And so I think this will be a similar situation where you put more chemistry in and something will happen that you did not anticipate. Yes, thank you. I do have a fear uh, of, of humans playing God. Um, and Professor Traffin, you have your hand up regarding this topic as well? Yeah, um, where the um, iron fertilization experiments have been done in the Southern Ocean, then it's a, an ephemeral um, response so you have to keep pouring more and more um, iron into the system. Um, and so the, the cost benefits haven't been really worked out, I don't think. Thank you so much. Um, last call for questions. Uh, Philip, did you have your hand up? Um, Khan, no, okay, very good. Um, well, I, I'm gonna say that that is a good place to end. Um, I, know, I wanna respect our guests' time. I want to thank you very, very, very much. This has been so wonderful. And we've been so excited about this event. Um, I know that people had to come and go. Um, we will be posting the video to this on our website and on YouTube, on our YouTube website. Um, so thank you, thank you. An extra special thank you to all of our panelists. And um, please, um, if you must go, we understand this is the end of the uh, panel discussion portion, but I do want to introduce Deepa, who will be speaking about our um, Climate Reality Project's picnic coming up. And of course, everyone here is invited. So Deepa, take it away. And thank you, thank you to our panelists. Thanks, Regina. So I'll make this very quick. Um, we'd like to take advantage of the warm weather to uh, have our next July chapter meeting as a picnic. So we'll be holding a picnic in Central Park, take a break from Zoom, um, have a chance to reconnect. So I am sharing a link uh, in the chat. So there's a sign up form just so we can get an idea of attendance, but um, it will be in Central Park on July 23rd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And um, if we have inclement weather that day, we'll do it the following Saturday, the 30th. So please, please come. It will be wonderful to see you all in person. Um, and the link is in the chat. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I, um, Paul, is there anything else or? No, I think that's it. I just wanna also extend my thanks to the panelists. This was an amazing, uh, panel, and I appreciate everything that you're doing and uh, continuing to do, despite the fact that some of you have gone on your pension. Uh, we expect a lot from you, Philip, still. <laughs> and thanks to everybody. Right. Thank you. And um, I just um, I just want to end by saying, can we just make room for the idea that we have in our ocean sea life? Okay, sea life, not necessarily seafood, and I'm not condemning anyone for their dietary choices, but if we can see them as living beings um, rather than just something to put on our plate, I think that would be a great start. Um, and I also, I always wanna put a plug in for um, single use plastics. It's a, it's a very scary thing very little of it gets recycled and a lot of it ends up in the ocean. So um, yes, our choices do matter so much. And we have just one beautiful planet and one beautiful ocean. And I wanna thank you all so much for being here tonight. It was a pleasure to, uh, to be here with all of you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.
Thank you all so much.